going to be winners, so let's get ready. First, first class I went to with this gentleman made me realize real quick my kids were never taking over if I'm in my mid-70s and it hasn't happened yet. So he, has, he has great contact. I got to tell you, Jeffrey Watson is an Ohio trial attorney and in residential, commercial, and investor since 1994, involved with self-directed IRAs, uh, retirement accounts. He's also actually recognized as a thought leader and teacher in self-directed IRAs, um, wealth protection, really. So Jeff is the general counsel for National Real Estate Investors Association and four other different national organizations also. He leads the lobbying efforts in D.C. all the time, bringing changes to the government regulations, the policies on distressed properties. He changed that. Uh, taxation and resales, and whether or not you have to be a dealer. He works with the Ohio Division of uh, Real Estate on teaching, wholesaling, and compliance, right where you want to be. Um, he had a great video that was on national website telling you where to walk that line. Jeff is general counsel and co-founder of Real Flow LLC, which made it in the Inc. 500. The secret tax angles is what he teaches along with tonight, you will learn the creative offer path to close off market deals while the rest of the world remains clueless for 2023. Let me introduce to you attorney Jeff Watson. Anna, thank you so very much. Oh, it is good to be here this evening. Let me get acquainted with how the acoustics work, how the sound works, and I got to tell you, the setup is great. Thank you. I'm still going to learn a couple of nuances. Um, how many of you are sports fans? How many of you enjoyed that national title championship game a week ago? Georgia and Ohio State. That was the game, okay? Unfortunately, the Buckeyes were wide left. Um, it breaks my heart, but yeah. Uh, life is interesting for me because I came this morning. I was in Tampa, Florida. And by the way, Anna, Anna, where are you? Larry Harbaugh and Pete Fortunato both last night told me to tell you hello because I was sitting with them last night at Larry's meeting there in St. Pete, and uh, they, found, they found out I was coming up here, and they are like, tell Anna we said hello. Yep. All right. So, a um, little bit about me. I don't have a bunch of slides on this, so we'll just cover it real quickly. My primary residence is in Conneaut, Ohio. How many of you know where Conneaut, Ohio is? It is the last exit on I-90, just before the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. The last exit, mile mark 241. And that's where I have to go this evening when I'm done here. All right, so I left Tampa, Florida this morning. I'll end up in Conneaut tonight by virtue of Detroit, where I had meetings this, for this afternoon and then here tonight. Um, second thing is I began buying residential real estate as an investor in 1994, and I've been a landlord ever since. So how many of you are landlords as well? Great. Now, the very first creative real estate deal I ever structured was actually in 1989. I was still in law school, but my mom and her husband were selling a house, and the guy they were selling it to had a good job, good income, but terrible credit. So we structured a seller finance deal where my mom and her husband were the bank, and the payments were made to them, and he made the payments, and he did that for like five years, and then he finally qualified, got a good loan, and paid them off. Okay, so I guess I've been playing around in the real estate space since 1989. Now, how many of you have been doing it longer than I have? I know Anna and several of the others have. All right, so some of you have been doing it longer than 89. Great. How many of you are on the flip side of this? You've yet to do your first deal as a real estate investor. Awesome. You are in the right place. Do you know Why? You're in the right place because you're going to get an education for little to no money. Tonight, you're going to keep your credit cards in your pocket. You're going to keep that folded over cash in your pocket. 
okay? Don't worry about it. You don't have to, you don't have, you're not spending big money. All right. Now you're looking at me going, okay. Okay, dude, you've probably figured out how the acoustics work. You figured out where you can stand and where you can't stand. So what's with the slide that says inflation investing? Well, how many of you remember the 1970s and early 80s with the last time we had inflation? We had in interest rates that went from 19 to 21 percent. Prime was 21 percent. Boy, I pray, I pray Jay Powell does not go there with that one. Oh, my soul. Yeah, I know. And, you know, 10 years ago, I ran into a guy by the name of Ed Slot, nation's number one expert on IRAs, and he was telling me about a number of people complaining to him that their 30-year CDs were expiring and they'd locked in at 20%, and they didn't know what to do. Well, yeah, that, that ship sailed. <laughs> All right, so how many of you have heard about inflation? How many of you notice prices are going up because of inflation? How many of you think inflation is going to affect the way that you invest as a real estate investor? Who do you think is the biggest beneficiary of inflation? The government. I'm thrilled that people from the Board of Revision are here for two reasons. Number one, most real estate investors don't even realize the Board of Revision exists. Okay, And if you're a real estate investor, you need to know that that board exists. You need to read their rules. And when you have a property that you believe those rules apply to, you need to go follow their rules. And you need to make a filing to try and lower your real estate taxes based upon what that property is really worth. Not what somebody else thought it was worth. Okay, The second, the second reason government really benefits is because it's another way of taxing us. Okay, But who else benefits from inflation over the long term? There's a huge class of people that a lot of you are members of that benefit from inflation. Who is that class of people? People who own real estate. People who own real estate. Why? Because real estate will keep pace with inflation. Rents will keep pace with inflation. Price of gas, milk, and eggs go up. By the way, has anybody seen the price of eggs lately? I mean, come on, man. I, I'm done. You want to talk about getting beat by egg beaters, okay? <laughs> so anyhow, but as that goes up, so does the other stuff, okay? Now, what breaks my heart, and Pete Fortune and I was talking about this last night, is a number of people in a building that he has a rental in received a notice that their taxes are going up $200 a month. $200 a month. That's $2,400 a month or $2,400 a year for someone who is on a fixed income. There's a lot of people in that building on fixed incomes of $1,500 a month or less. And they're now having to spend $600 of that $1,500 on their taxes and HOA. I'm like, what are they down to now? One meal every other day? That's all they got money for now? All right. So let's talk about inflation because, folks, whether you like it or not, whether we talk about it or not, whether we know about it or not, inflation is affecting the way we buy real estate. Can you agree with me on that? Can somebody give me a very big obvious reason of how inflation has affected in the last seven months how we buy real estate? I heard it. Somebody said it. Higher interest rates. Yes. Higher interest rates. Why are interest rates higher? Trying to slow down inflation. I'm not sure it's going to work. But they'll keep going. That's okay. Well, if they go up enough to do like Paul Volcker did in 1980, then look out. Okay? But in the meantime, I'm going to be planning on still buying houses. Okay? I'm still planning on buying houses. In fact, on my three-hour drive home tonight, I've got an hour and a half call scheduled to talk about a commercial deal I'm working on, okay? So yeah, I'm, it's, I'm still buying. All right, well, let's talk about this. So here's a, want anybody want to know an interesting number? What is the average interest rate for residential mortgages over the past 50 years? I hear a seven. I hear an eight. I hear a nine. I hear a six, I hear a seven, 
Anybody want to know the answer? Yeah. Or are we going to keep chit-chatting back there? All right, 7.7. .7. So those of you that were 7 and 8s, you were right there. Congratulations. 7.7% .7 has been the average residential mortgage rate over the last 50 years. So does that mean that we're now in unprecedented times? No. It means that we're almost kind of like back to normal. But we've been conditioned to think of low interest rates as important for us. Well, when money is cheap, there's more of it, and guess what happens? Prices just go racing up. That's what inflation, that's what inflation does. Okay, so now I got to do this boring legal mumbo jumbo, so bear with me, okay? This presentation is designed to be educational in nature. It is not providing legal, financial, tax, or psychiatric advice. Okay, just education. While the session does showcase some individuals who've had successes applying their education, actual results, your actual results, will completely depend upon the skills, effort, time, and dedication that you or each individual puts into their business. Okay? Individual results will vary. Do we all look the same? No. Individual results are going to be like everybody else. We're all going to be a little different. Okay? We're all going to be able to stand upright, walk, talk, take nourishment, and do deals, but we may all do it differently, all right? Okay. So here's a question for you. Do you have all of the real estate deals that you want, and are they structured exactly how you want them? Because if the answer is yes, I bid you good night. You may leave the rest of us mere mortals behind, okay? I don't have enough deals. I'm looking for more deals, okay? They're, the deals I've got, I'm still working on tweaking them and structuring them and so on because they're not all the way I want because you know what? It's an always ever-evolving process. So, but I got to ask this question. What is the market data really telling us? Do you need me to stand still in one spot or can I move around? Okay, because I know we got an online streaming audience and I want to be kind to them as well. But I do like to move just a little bit because if I spend all my time over on one side, then the rest of the people think I'm, I'm, they've offended me or I've offended them, okay? Oh, by the way, speaking of being offended, I better do this now, okay? I know where I am, okay? I'm in the great state of Ohio, all right? But I got to tell you, I am not woke and I am not PC, okay? My preferred pronouns are y'all and you and. Okay? And my mandatory adjectives are smart and good looking. Okay? Those are my mandatory adjectives. So if you're going to say something to me, you have to say, Mr. Watson, you're smart and good looking. All right? So my, but my preferred pronouns are y'all and you and, okay? Now, folks, I say that with a little bit of jest. Some of my good friends in Congress are Democrats. Some of my good friends in Congress are Republicans. I work both sides of the aisle. We get stuff done. All right? But I got a question for you. What do you think the market data is telling us? I can tell you with exact certainty that all of the experts out there, all of the pundits out there, whether they're on Fox News, CNBC, anywhere else, bloviating wherever they're bloviating, they can all agree on absolutely one thing. No one can agree and no one knows. No one can agree and no one knows, okay? So I want to talk to you about a method that we have used as real estate investors. I've seen this used in the 1960s. I've seen it used in the 1970s. I've used it in the 1980s. I've used it in the 1990s. I've used it in 2000s. I've used it in the last decade. So I know it works, okay? I want to talk about strategies that work when housing prices are going up. You notice housing prices are still going up just a little bit, all right? But also, some of you might have noticed that there's now uh, price adjustments on the market. That's the new term for a price reduction, okay? Um, local markets can be up, okay? There are certain markets that I work in that are hot. Off the Dallas North Toll or the DNT in Texas, north out of Dallas, 
going up through Prosper, McKinney, and Frisco, that market is blazing hot, okay? You go over where I live, and my little sleepy town makes Toledo look like a thriving metropolis, all right? It just does. Now, I just hit a button on this thing, and I have no idea what I did to it. So my market is already kind of like waffling on the way down, okay, where I live. Um, this technique works when inflation is going up. This technique will work when inflation finally starts to come down. And by the way, when they tell you that inflation is coming down and the grocery store prices and the gas pump prices don't match, believe your wallet, not what they say on TV, okay? Because they're probably just changing the way they change the calculation, which they've only changed four times in the last 20 years, all right? So it works during a housing reset. It also works during a housing surge or boom, in fact, I was on a phone call with an investor who wants to be buying in the sleepy town of Wyndham, Ohio. That's on the other side of the state between Cleveland and Youngstown, right off the turnpike. And we're talking about a strategy there. And I'm like, um, you got to buy for cash flow in Wyndham, Ohio. You don't get appreciation in Wyndham, Ohio. You got to buy for cash flow. Okay. How many of you guys are buying for cash flow? How many of you guys buy for appreciation? Okay. I buy a little bit for appreciation in certain markets, but it's still got to have break-even cash flow, okay? But where I live, where I invest in Northeast Ohio, whether it's in Cleveland, Ohio, or Conneaut, because I invest in both cities, if it doesn't cash flow, I ain't interested, all right? It's got to cash flow. All right, so let's go through this. Boy, hit all, check all the boxes, okay? So the market fortune tellers will tell you everybody agrees on absolutely one thing. Nobody knows. But we're going to talk about creative financing tonight. So let me define what is creative financing for the purposes of our conversation tonight. Okay? Creative financing explained. It's an unusual or innovative way of structuring a loan to buy real estate. There's types of creative financing. Seller financing, lease option, lease purchase, rent to own, master lease, land contract, self-directed IRA funding, like from Equity Trust or Quest Trust or some of the other companies I work with, hard money loans, private money, cash out refis, HELOCs, and other things, takeaways, sleeping seconds, carrybacks, all those things, okay? All those are different things out there. Now, somebody decided to go over to that authoritative source, Wikipedia, okay? Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I got to just, just suppress a little grin because I think Wikipedia is not an authoritative source. It's a really good first place to look, okay? And it says, in real estate, creative financing is non-traditional or uncommon means of buying land or property. How many of you just want to be ordinary? How many of you want to be extraordinary or uncommon? I'll put me in the uncommon crowd, okay? Put me in the uncommon crowd, all right? So it's an uncommon way of buying land or property. The goal of creating financing is to purchase or finance a property with the buyer investing uses as little of their own money as possible, otherwise known as leveraging. Eh, maybe, maybe not. Using these techniques, an investor may be able to purchase multiple properties using little or none of their, quote, own money. All right? Now, I like you to have some skin in the game. But you don't have to, this is not the day and age where if you don't want to, you don't have to write checks to pay for things, all right? There's other ways of buying, there's other ways of buying good real estate. All right, so why does creative financing matter? So if you're like, Jeff, take it easy on me. I know you've been doing this a long time, but this is my first year as an investor. In fact, this might be my first meeting here in Toledo. So would you please get it down to where you can understand it, okay? Like, I, gotta, I, I just think about it from this point of view. I got to get it down to where um, my granddaughter's only like a year old, so it's really I can't even get it down to that level because she's, you know, she's, she's with books and one-word sentences and things like that. But I'm going to try and get it like up to a, like where a fourth grader would get it, all right? Will that work for you? I'm going to try and do that, Okay. So creative financing means no qualifying or personal guarantees. No qualifying means you don't have to go through the bank underwriting process. Okay? 
No personal guarantees means that you may not be personally promising to make all of those payments. There may be another solution to that. All right? Price becomes secondary. Huh? You're gonna, some of you are going like, what do you mean, Jeff? Price becomes secondary. We'll get into that. I'm going to make you think about something, okay? But if you're in that wholesaler, big cash hammer, I'll pay cash and close quickly mode, I'm going to challenge your thinking tonight. There's other ways to buy real estate besides just as cheap as cash as possible, all right? You can set the interest rate instead of the market setting the interest rate. Negotiating a deal right now with a, for a client of mine, he's doing, he's selling one, one commercial building, buying another commercial property. We're negotiating between myself and the seller's attorney as to the interest rate that we're going to pay at different parts. We're not negotiating with a bank. I'm negotiating between two parties as to what the interest rate is going to be. Right now, we're going to have the interest rate run at 4% for the first three years. That's less than what a bank would charge. All right? Your docs versus the lender docs. How many of you would like to sign loan documents prepared by an actual living, breathing human being that you've had a conversation with than some nameless, faceless institution that they just hit a button and out all sprints and here you got to sign this pack of paper this thick? Did you hear me on that one? How many would rather sign the person's paperwork how many of you would rather sign the institution's stack of paperwork? How many of you are not going to do anything in response to my questions? <laughs> I've got a few more of you to laugh at me. Okay, that's fine. All right, I can go with that. I can, I can live with that. All right. So we're going to do a little brain teaser exercise. So first off, I need to know, can you see the screen? Okay. All right, so we've got two different sums of money up on, this, up on the screen, right? Would you agree with that those sums of money are two rather different numbers? They're like a hundred and some odd thousand dollars difference between the two, right? But both loans have a monthly payment of a thousand dollars a month for the next 30 years. Jeff, how is that possible? How is it possible for them to both have $1,000 a month for the next 30 years and they're both paid off? What did I hear you say? Interest rate. Okay. I think you're right. So let's take a look at this. The interest rate on one of them is 6%. The other one is 2%. So what are you thinking now? Boy, if I can buy a property and I can keep my payment at $1,000 a month and I can collect $2,400 a month out of it in rent, does it really matter what I pay for it? Well, it depends. How long am I going to own it? What are my grandkids going to do with it when they inherit it from me? See, I'm already thinking three generations, all right? If you don't hear anything else I say today and you're really serious about being a real estate investor, write that down. Think three generations ahead. Not three meals ahead, but three generations ahead, okay? So there's ways of structuring deals because if I'm looking for cash flow, then I'm going to say, okay, cash flow matters more than price because if I can work with the term and the interest rate, then the price can sometimes be secondary. But if I'm buying to fix and flip, price is everything or almost everything. If I'm buying to quickly resell because I'm a wholesaler, price is everything. But if I'm buying as an investor, cash flow matters more. Does anybody disagree with me? Okay, good. 
All right, so let's get into this a little bit more, just to explain this out. You got two houses side by side. Let's whoop, get that back there. All right. We're going to buy one house for $166,800, and we're going to pay 6% interest on it. Our interest rate, our payment is $1,000. Over here, we had a seller that was like, my neighbor sold his house a year ago for $270,000. Zillow says my house is worth $270,000. I must sell my house for that. Anybody ever talk to a seller like that? Oh, I just had one last month. Zillow says, Zillow says, well, I got news for you. Zillow ain't writing the check. Zillow ain't putting the tenant in the house. Zillow ain't doing anything else. I am. All right? But if you're stuck on Zillow, can we agree to go with my terms? If I give you your Zillow, can we do it my way? Where I don't personally guarantee the note? And I lock it in where it's $1,000 a month and you get your two seventy. dollars Now, do I like that for real estate tax purposes? No, I don't at all. Okay? But I'll work with it. Now, so do you struggle with, how many of you don't have enough buyers for the properties you're trying to sell? Anybody? Wow. i got to take a minute and process that. You know, one of the first times I ever did this presentation, I was in Dallas, Texas, and it was an audience filled with what I can kind of refer to as the real estate house buying ninjas. These are the guys that run companies that buy two and three and four houses a week. Okay, some of them, one of them is my client, he only buys two houses a day. All right, <clears throat> buys two a day, sells two a day. Another couple guys in the room, they were only buying like 500 a year. You know, um, so they're just trying to figure out how to do it. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm, I'm joking, folks. And I would ask them, do they have enough buyers? And they go, no, we don't have enough buyers. We need more buyers, Okay. Um, do you struggle with the market changing? How many of you, this market change has kind of affected how you're doing stuff? How many of the rest of you are going to finally pay attention and answer my questions? Because this market's changed the way you're doing stuff. That or you ain't doing anything. Okay? It's one of the two. It's either change what you're doing or you ain't doing anything. Now, if you're going to continue to come to meetings and you're going to talk about how, well, this deal got away, blah, 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 you know, you're not closing on anything, you're not talking to sellers, you're not making offers, you're not showing up at title companies, okay, well then, yeah. Anyhow, increasing interest rates, has that kind of messed you up? It's messed me up, but I'll overcome it. Um, how many of you, besides me, have dealt with high price demands from sellers who are convinced that their price is still what it should be even though interest rates have doubled. I mean, it's, it's amazing. I mean, one of my clients is a gifted, gifted psychological linguist on the phone with sellers. And this is the biggest struggle that she has. She spends eight hours a day, five days a week on the phone talking to potential sellers. And sellers who are still stuck on year old pricing, 18 month old pricing, middle of the COVID pandemic pricing. They're like, well, my neighbors sold their house for $270,000 and I got to get 270. Well, guess what? Your neighbor sold when I could go get an interest rate at 2.4%. Now it's six and a half. You see what that does for my payment? Do you got a tenant that's going to pay the extra in rent? Oh, you don't? Well, then guess what? All right. Marketing that's ineffective. How many of you are spending money every month on marketing to buy houses? That's it? That's all that's in the room? How many of you have any sort of consistent marketing campaign for attracting deals to you? Anna, the next time I come back, not this Saturday, but we're going to talk about that, okay? 
I think what we'll probably have to do is grab him by the scruff of his neck and bring his bald head up here. But my buddy Johnny C. in Dayton, Ohio, who has more people beating on his door to buy houses than he knows what to do with. Anybody know who John Cochran is in Dayton, Ohio? Oh, my. Dude, dude's light, lights out, okay? All right, so how many, anybody here training people how to buy houses as part of your business? Cool. All right. How many of you want more rentals? How many of you are like me and you want more rentals? So I'm in a mastermind with some really good friends, and I could kind of like see the jaws drop and hit the floor when I said to them that I have a goal that in the next five years, I want to add 500 doors to my portfolio. They looked at me like, I go, yeah, Jeff's done playing around, okay? Jeff's gotten comfortable. Jeff's got enough passive income. He doesn't have to work if he doesn't want to, but Jeff's decided that he wants to get after this now, okay? So we're going after some stuff, all right? So this matters to me. Um, Working with a new, I guess I'll call her a client. She hasn't paid me a retainer yet, but I was working with her on a deal. She's selling in Dayton, Ohio, or thinking about selling in Dayton, Ohio, a 300-unit apartment complex, and we were trying to structure some creative terms to it, okay? So some of you are going to be like, well, Jeff, wait a second. Um, you're talking about creative in apartment complexes, and you're talking about creative with office buildings, and you're talking about creative with vacant land. Does it work with houses? Yeah, it does. It does. But I'm just in a different area where I'm doing creative deals on whether it's a house or an apartment complex. It's still the same principles, okay? So just hang with me, all right? So you can pay a little bit more and yet make more money. Not a bad idea. You can grow by monetizing more leads, which means that you'll get more deals done because if you can make a creative offer instead of a cash offer, then you'll buy more houses. Now, out of curiosity, how many of you consistently make cash offers to sellers? What percent of the ARV do you generally offer, sir? Wow, congratulations. Good for you. Good. Pardon me? I think it will too, yeah. But then, let me ask you this. How, what, what percentage are you paying of the current market value? Not the ARV, not the after repair value, but current market value. Okay, but on a, on a, on a fix and flip or wholesale deal? There's that formula. That formula has been around for as long as I've been doing this. Yep. And what else? On a wholesale deal, what are you trying to do? Got you. Yep. Yeah. 10K is a good number for an assignment fee in the state of Ohio. Because you go over 10K, then I'm going to want you to double close. That video that I did with you, Chief Legal Counsel of the Ohio Division of Real Estate, is still used to teach real estate agents across the United States and elsewhere about wholesaling. It teaches investigators in a lot of other states about wholesaling, how to investigate it, how to regulate it. Um, and we kind of agreed off the record that assignment fees, 10K on down are cool. Above that, double close it especially in this market. Yep. All right. So how many of you understand the difference between owning a business and owning a system? Can somebody explain to me what they think is the difference between owning a business and owning a system? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Correct. So I'm going to give you two examples of a business that runs solely on systems. Chick-fil-A. You can walk into Chick-fil-A and 18 and 19 year olds are running the place. Why? Because they're following the systems. Is it their business? No. They're just following the systems. Okay? My business, or one of my businesses unfortunately, is all me. Okay, there's very few, I have very few systems in place for me as a lawyer because you, I actually have to think, you know, all right? So anyway, I want to share with you a decision tree process 
coming up, okay? Would you agree with me that if you've got more options of how to present offers to sellers, you're going to close more deals? Is that a yes or is that a yes? Is that a yes or is that a, Jeff, it doesn't matter what you say, I'm going to sit here with my arms crossed, I'm not going to make that much eye contact with you, and I'm just going to pretend that I'm not hearing you. Anybody like that? Okay, good. By the way, if I've offended you, you're easy. I'm going to work harder on it next time, all right? <laughs> all right. That's just me being funny, folks. I'm tr seriously, I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings. All right. So you can either have an art or a system. Practicing law is an art. Buying houses can be a system. Okay? Buying houses doesn't have to be complicated. We don't have to be intellectual geniuses like Peter Fortunato. Okay? The man is the smartest residential real estate investor that I've ever met in my life. And I have probably spoken to or been around close to 100,000 aspiring residential real estate investors. Pete Fortunato is hands down the smartest guy in the room. I mean, just the fact that he's a friend of mine just makes me pinch myself. All right? We can keep it simple, where instead of the owner of the company being the only one that can make the offers, somebody else that works with you, someone that's your assistant, can help make those offers. Instead of taking a very long time to crunch the numbers and analyze it, we can simplify this down to a systematic process and begin to make that offer very quickly. If you're able to make offers quicker, do you think you're going to close more deals? If you're like, oh, this is, i got to go home and think about this one for a week, you think you're going to get that deal? I don't know. All right. How about, well, Jeff, there's just so many different ways of doing a creative deal. I don't know what to do. Well, what if we boil it down to three things? We boiled it down to three things. One, two, or three, A, B, or C. Could pretty much everybody do that? Is there anybody that's going to say to me, Jeff, three is too many, too complicated? I'm waiting. All right, cool. Cool. Just want to make sure. All right. So, in fact, it's so simple that your high school son or daughter could follow it. Yeah. Yeah. I can show you a system. I'll show a little bit to you today, but on Saturday, I'm going to talk, through, talk you through it for about five hours. Maybe there'll be a little bit break while you guys eat lunch, and maybe I shove a Snickers bar down and wash it down with some tea. Um, but we're for five hours on Saturday, we're going to go through this in almost excruciating detail. All right? I'm not going to make it painful, but we're going to cover a lot of stuff on Saturday. All right? So we're going to show you three simple paths for making creative offers to every lead, opportunity, deal, or seller that you encounter. Just out of curiosity, how many of you have talked to a seller in the last week? All right, let's do that again. But I'm going to be... I'm going to try and do this from a kinder, gentler perspective, all right? How many of you already have enough houses in your portfolio? Never enough, okay? I, I'm, just, I'm not raising my hand because I do. I'm just raising my hand. Maybe somebody else will, okay? Because I need more houses. You already heard me say I, got, I want 500 more doors, okay? All right? So how many of you have all the houses you want? Okay, nobody? How many of you have all the deals you want? Nobody. How many of you have talked to at least one seller in the last week? So if you don't have all the houses you want, if you don't have all the deals you want, and you haven't been talking to sellers, could we kind of figure out what's going on? Either you're not doing anything or you don't know what to say. So can I give you all a break and say it's probably because you don't know what to say? And so maybe I could give you a couple of things to think about. Maybe you could use these terms and these words. You know, there's a couple of simple sentences. Would that work? All right. 
So we're going to give everybody that shows up on Saturday this creative offer blueprint. A very simple step. Three phases, three steps to every phase. Three phases, three steps to every phase. Everybody that comes on Saturday gets this. What do you got to do to get this thing? You got to show up on Saturday and you got to fog a mirror. Okay? You got to be able to breathe. Okay? Breathe, baby, breathe. That's all. All right? Now, who would accept a creative offer? I remember one time I was making a creative offer to this uppity, snooty lady in Rocky River, Ohio. How many of you know where Rocky River, Ohio is? <laughs> yep. Uppity and snooty. Mm, yeah. And she looked at me and she goes, I'm not a desperate or motivated seller. I didn't say you were. I'm just making you an offer. You know? Anyhow, so there's two types of people who would cre accept, or create, accept a creative offer. Because there's actually two categories of property sellers. This is probably where if you're not taking notes, you should start taking notes, okay? So if you're not taking notes, this is where you want to take notes. Now, I've realized that the Gen Z millennial version of taking notes is taking pictures of my slides. All right? But for us baby boomers, it's still we pull out something and write it down, okay? Because we recognize that the muscle memory of actually writing it down on paper further embeds it into our cerebral cortex, okay? All right? All right. So we got people who have a money problem. They're selling their house because they got a money problem. They either can no longer afford the house, they need money for something else, they are getting a divorce, something went wrong somewhere, okay? Right now, there are certain subdivisions in my hot market of Plano, not Plano, but Frisco, McKinney, Prosper, Texas, right on north of Plano, Texas, on the DNT, okay, that people are getting priced out of those markets. They bought those houses five years ago. They have doubled or more in value, and the real estate taxes have more than doubled, and their paychecks haven't grown to where they can keep up with the increasing house payments. Because when your real estate taxes start to be $1,000 or more a month, that can get expensive, okay, on a single-family house. Some of these people are going to be fixing to sell. We're going to see a greater swath of people selling because they can no longer afford the real estate taxes. That means when they do, border revision people might be a little busier because the next person buying may not be paying what they thought was fair market value. All right? And then the next group of people that are selling is because they've got a real estate problem. They've got a house problem. They have been told by the doctor that they can no longer go up and down stairs. Or they're like me. They had five kids. They raised the five kids in the house. And now they're in the house by themselves and they feel like a BB in a tin can. You ever had that feeling? You got way more house than you need. Before that house got sold, I think there were rooms in my house that I had not been in in two years. Seriously. There was no reason for me to be in there. I mean, for as much as I traveled, it's for as big as the house was. In fact, no one else was there. You know, okay. Anyhow. All right. So this is the other thing I'm going to give you on Saturday when you show up. I'm going to give you this as well. All right? So by the way, how many of you are planning on being here on Saturday? How many hands? One, two, three. Oh, yeah. You're starting to get warmed up. How many of you have already filled out the paperwork you need to be here on Saturday? Well, time to get that paperwork in your hands because you're going to get the paperwork in your hands even if you're still thinking, Jeff, I don't know if I really like you enough to come spend five hours with you. You're still going to get that paperwork, all right? Because I'm going to teach you the questions to ask. We're going to cover the questions to ask. And then we're going to cover what to do after we ask the question. All right? And we're going to learn how to crush some objections. What's an objection? It's some sort of 
temporary reason why the seller won't agree to your terms or your offer. All right? So we're going to overcome those objections. All right? We're going to show you how to structure offers. Now, I'm going to walk you through deal after deal after deal, how it was structured, why it was structured, and what made it work. And some of you are like, well, Jeff, you're talking about deals that are structured. Are you talking about how you nailed the two two-by-fours together in the house? No, we're not talking about that kind of structure. We're talking about how we structured the money for buying the house. So now, you see, if I wanted to pretend like I was a big shot, I would say, we we're going to talk about how we structured the capital stack. Forget it. We're going to just talk about how we structured the money to put the house deal together, all right? All right. So there are three types of creative offer sellers. Did you know that? There are three types of creative offer sellers. Okay? This is where you want to keep taking notes. The first kind is the people who need more money now. The second kind is people who need some money now. And the third kind, and these are my favorites, they need less to no money now. Now, does anybody have any ideas to why those people are my favorites? Because they're more interested in terms, and they don't need more money out of my pocket right now to get a deal closed. They have other things in mind, and I'm a huge fan of that. Am I breaking the rule? I'm sorry. I'll fix it. All right. So here's a case study. This is an interesting one. A student of note school wanted to buy this office building in his hometown. Now, the owner was interested in selling the building. I want to buy. You want to sell. Let's make a deal. Here's what happened. There was a problem. The student didn't want to pay more than $1.6 million cash. The sellers are like, not a dime less than $2 million. Not a dime less than $2 million. So, what do you think? Can you get this deal done? The answer is yes, you can. The answer is yes, you can get this deal done. So let's talk about some of the things that were done to get this deal done. We used a very simple creative offer approach that ended up turning the whole deal around quickly. How do you overcome a $400,000 gap? How do you do it? You got to ask the right questions. You got to change what you're talking about. So let's cover what the questions were. We asked this question, what are your immediate cash needs? The sellers were two boys that had inherited this building from their dad. They had been running it and collecting rent off of it. What were their immediate cash needs? Zero to next to nothing. Okay? That was, the, that was a good question. But you want to know what the real good question was? This was the one that turned it all around. The question was, would you be open to a tax strategy offer? Or do you want to pay more to the IRS? Would you be interested in a tax strategy offer? Or do you want to pay more to the IRS? How many of you are in the, I want to pay more to the IRS group? Huh? Huh? I'm shocked. Well, then how many of you are in the tax strategy offer? Well, you got to come on Saturday to see how it all works. Okay? you got to come on Saturday to see how it all works. Because on Saturday, I'm going to explain to you how we showed these sellers how if they structured the deal the way the buyer was going to make the offer, the way we coached the buyer to make the offer, there was a very good chance that the sellers would pay this 
in taxes on the gain of the sale of this building. This is a good number to pay in taxes, right? That is zero. That is goose egg. That is zilch. That is nada. That is a great number to pay in taxes. So, there are three types of sellers. Those that need more money now. Those that need some money now. And those that need less or no money now. But we're going to have to figure out how to make an offer to all of them. But the first two questions you got to ask them is number one, the Pete Fortunato question. Why would you want to sell a nice property like this? And then how many of you know what to do after you ask that question? You take your right hand and you jam it into your mouth and you leave it there so that you don't say anything until the awkward silence has passed and they've told you everything about why they want to sell that house. I'm exaggerating a little bit, okay? But you ask the question and you shut up. All right? One of the best guys in this business that I know, how many of you know Bill Cook? Bill Cook spoke at Orea, okay? Bill Cook is fantastic for how much he can get a seller to talk about. And the only two things that people know about Bill is, number one, his name is Bill and his wife's got red hair. That's all you're going to know about Bill. Okay? That's it. So you ask the Pete Fortunato question. Why would you want to sell a nice property like this? And then you... Okay? And the second question that you ask is, what are your immediate cash needs? Not what do you need in a year, not what do you need in five years, but what are your immediate cash needs? Now, just out of curiosity, and this is where I'm, I'm deviating from my script a little bit, so forgive me, but how many of you recently have recently gone down and put money into the bank at a certificate of depression? <laughs> how many of you have put money into the stock market in the last year and lost at least 20%? like my 401k has. So let me see if I got this right, Mr. Seller. You're going to put the money into the market where it's already been down 20% for the last year, and it doesn't look any better for this year. Or let me get this right, Mr. Seller. You're going to go put the money into a certificate of depression and maybe make one or one and a half, maybe as much as 2% on your money. If you could do better than that, would you be interested? In fact, if you could make interest on money that you would otherwise be paying in taxes, what do you think about that? Let me ask that question again, because I want you to write it down. If you could make interest on money that you would otherwise be paying in taxes, how do you feel about that? And then shut up and let them talk. And just wait and let them, and just listen. And don't listen to answer, listen to understand. Now, if you're taking notes, write that down. Listen to understand. All right? And I'm being really mean to all you Gen Zs and Millennials because that's not in a slide, okay? So you can't take a picture of it. You're going to have to write it down. You're going to have to put a little note in your phone. All right? All right. So there's two types of payouts. For people who need cash, there's two types of ways of paying them cash, right? Lump sums and payments. Has anybody got a third way? I haven't found one yet. <laughs> that's a, yeah, well, that's, that's some of each, half and half. All right, so this works from relatively cheap mobile home land deals to multi-million dollar properties. It works with houses, it works with land, it works with commercial real estate, it works with apartments, it works with office buildings, it works with single families, it works with duplexes, it works with fourplexes, it works with 24 plexes, whatever, it works, okay? 
So when I talk about mobile homes, land, single families, duplexes, small multifamilies, medium multifamilies, and apartment complexes, is there anything I left out besides self-storage? It works with that too, by the way. Is there anything I left out? So is there anybody who's investing in anything other than what, we've, than what I just covered right there? In real estate, you're doing something other than that. It works with any kind of commercial property. Yep, creative financing works with any of those. The bigger, the, the, big, the bigger, more odd the property, the more likely it is that there's creative financing involved. So what are the concerns with creative offers? Well, sellers won't do it. Well, that all depends. My lawyer says it's illegal. Well, yeah, your lawyer needs to go back to law school. All right? I can't do it. Well, let me help you with that too, okay? I can't make money today. Well, if you show up on Saturday, I'll show you how to grab both your cake and eat it too. How many of you, when you wholesale a house, how many times do you get paid on it? One time? When you fix and flip a house, how many times do you get paid on it? When you run it as a rental, how many times do you get paid on it? Assuming the tenant pays and nothing breaks, you get paid, right? Well, if I can show you a way how to get some money now and some money over time and then more money at the end, would you be interested in getting paid three times or three different ways? Boom, 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 boom. Okay, we can do that. But you got to be here on Saturday. Sorry. Okay, got to be here on Saturday. All right, too cumbersome. Oh, it's just, Jeff, it's just too hard to figure out all these different things. Not scalable. I can't repeatedly do this. It's only for weird properties. No, it's not. It's not only for weird properties. And I'm scared to learn. Well, we're going to try and make this as painless as possible. Okay? I'm going to try and make this as painless as possible on Saturday. All right? But you know what we've discovered? The number one obstacle holding investors like y'all back. See, there, I just used it. My favorite pronoun, y'all. I'm not even from the South, okay? Not even from the South, but I use it. Because y'all and you and it's just, it's just a nice, kind, general word, okay? Those are nice words. You know what's holding them back? It's a feeling of being overwhelmed. But if we can simplify it down to a one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, Will it cover everybody? No, but it'll cover 80%. 80% is pretty good. Okay? So, yeah, come back on Saturday, and we'll cover for when your cash offer doesn't work. And if you're a licensed agent and you're legally doing novations, and it won't work. Did you hear that? What I just said? If you're not a licensed agent, don't worry about it. Because if you're not a licensed agent, you can't do a novation, particularly in the state of Ohio. All right? All right. So instead of having those two options, you got three more. You got creative path number one, creative path number two, and creative path number three. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to present that many different offers? Oh, I can go all cash. I could possibly do a novation. But I can definitely give you creative offer one, two, or three. And with creative offer one, there might be some cash involved. And with creative offer two, there might be a little bit of cash involved with that too. Both lump or payments. Get some more flexibility in there. All right? All right. So that's where we're going to, that's where you learn how to do this. Let me just cut right to the chase. Let me just get right to the chase. I don't want you to learn how to do this just for your own mental exercise. Don't bother. I want you to come on Saturday, learn how, to do, learn how to do this so that on Sunday or Monday, the day or two after, you start using it on sellers. But if you're not planning on talking to sellers, then it's just stuff taking up space in your brain. But if you're planning on using it and talking to sellers, I can pretty much tell you it's going to change your bank account, it's going to change your balance sheet, and it's going to change your estate plan after a while. Because you're going to have more houses than you know what to do with. Okay? 
So our data shows that 78% of the creative offers that can be constructed can fit within path one, path two, or path three. Now I'm going to tell you, 70 to 80% is not a bad day, all right? I'll make it to the Hall of Fame if I hit it one out of three times in the, in the Major League Baseball, all right? So you're going to say, well, Jeff, you know, this all sounds interesting, it all sounds good, but, you know, I just don't think there's that many people doing this. Well, the market data says otherwise. Market data says that in 2021, there was over $27 billion of creative residential real estate deals that were closed. I know last fall I was pushing, last, even last month I was pushing a lot hard in Congress for Congress to authorize a study on the amount of seller financing over the last 20 years. Okay? Because I don't think we appreciate just how much is really happening in the seller financing space. But $27 billion is a big number, right? So this method could be fit because it works with leads from seniors, landlords, inherited houses, people who even have high price demands. If you've got an acquisition team, it lets you filter out more for potential. If you want to build a portfolio of rentals, this works, okay? It's another way to create existing cash flow. Oh, I love that. I cannot wait to show you some of the cash flow strategies. So here's the invitation. You're invited to attend for what I call free because you're not paying me anything. You've got to cover the room cost. You've got to cover the cost of lunch. And I think that's all on the flyer that you were given, $99 for your member, which is, by the way, for five hours of my time, that's dirt stinking cheap because my hourly rate's 500 bucks an hour. Okay? Um, master class, I'm going to give you five hours of my time you're going to get lunch. You're going to get a chance to hang out with friends. So this is where it's time. If you have not yet begun to fill out your form, this is where you take out a pencil, you bum, borrow, or steal a pencil or a pen, and you start filling out the form, okay? Because I want you to be here on Saturday. Now, what are we going to do on Saturday? We're going to start at 9 o'clock in the morning, okay? means I'm going to have poured a couple of Starbucks into me by then. And we're going to go hard till 2 o'clock in the afternoon. We're going to pause long enough for you guys to eat some food, but I'll probably be talking in between bites of a Snickers bar and chugging down some more Earl Grey tea from Starbucks, okay? But we're going to get it for five hours. Now, are you going to have the chance to ask questions then? Absolutely. Questions are good. I want you to ask them. If I say something that doesn't make sense, I want you to call me out on it, all right? But that's what we're going to do on Saturday. So now, I want you to get this figured out. January 14th, 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. On what day? Saturday. Saturday, January 14th. At what time? Saturday. Till when? Do you guys get lunch? And breakfast. Oh, okay, breakfast too. Wow, this is turning to be an even better deal. All right, so that's what it is. Oh, by the way, it's going to be here, I believe, and I will be here. No, it won't not be here. here. Not, where is it going to be? Awesome. You mean classroom style where they can actually take better notes? Yeah. Fantastic. Paper notes. Oh, my. You get food? You get the ability to take notes, sit in a classroom? Wow. Okay. So that's where it's going to be. Um, me here. All right. So let's look. Class agenda. By the end of that master class, you're going to learn what questions to ask motivated sellers. You're going to ask, figure out which one of your current leads may accept a creative offer right now. You may have a deal on your plate that you don't even know about. Because you're like, well, I don't have the cash to buy that house. What do I do? Well, let's make a creative offer. You're going to learn how to overcome some common objections. And here's the part that I really want to teach you. I'm going to show you how to take two sections of the tax code, connect them together, and explain to sellers how they can sell their property to you with a creative offer, and they pay nothing in federal income tax on that capital gain. They pay nothing. Is that a pretty cool thing to learn? I think so. All right. And so how to structure a basic deal that will get accepted. These are simple things to do. We're going to make it, keep it di 
down to where we're talking like four-year-old, I'm um, fourth graders, eight years old, fourth graders, okay? All right, and everybody that attends, you're going to get both of those handouts. You're going to get both of those handouts. So here's the time for those of you that are still thinking about it. Get your forms filled out, take action, and let's get this done. Now, next steps. Let me see, what are the next steps? Well, let's hit the button and see. To reserve your seat at the training, go ahead and do as Anna instructs us and get your paperwork filled out. Anna, I surrender back the balance of my time. I'm done flapping my lips. Hey, 